Hello and welcome to The Confident Commit, the podcast for everyone who wants to join the conversation on how to build software better and faster. If you're looking to build a toasted chip, tune in less confidently commit. You're listening to episode 10 of season two. I'm your host, Rob Zuber, CTO of CircleCI. Today we're trying something a little bit different. We're, I guess, 10 episodes in uh, to this season where we've been focusing on failure and learning from failure. And one of the themes that keeps coming up is talking about failure. And so I've invited our very own Emma Webb, VP of Corporate Communications at CircleCI, who uh, has been my partner in a lot of communication, both internal and external over the years. Um, and uh, And we're going to dive in with the expert and just talk about talking about failure. It's a little bit meta, but I'm going to go with it. Emma, thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited about this. Oh, thanks, Rob. Chief failure communicator, reporting for duty, ready to share some, I don't know, I'm not going to say wisdom. I don't know if wisdom is the right word, but hopefully others can learn from some of the mistakes that I've made. So let's, let's get into it. Well, I mean, that's just it, right? Our mistakes turn into wisdom over time. So I think that's perfect. And, um, you know, I was alluding to this a little bit before we started, but well, so first of all, when did we start working together? It was before Circle CI. Nobody knows that, or maybe many people don't know that. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but I think it was 2012. It was 2012. 2012. Mm -hmm. Uh, At a previous company, uh, which, which I had started with Jim, who's our CEO. So a lot of history there. But one of the things that's particularly interesting about that was it was a very small business. We were trying to find product market fit. We went through a couple different cycles. There was a lot of experimentation. And I'm sort of curious, like, you know, from your own experience, that that cycle or that set of cycles, other things you've done, do you think that working in that really small environment where it's kind of known, like we don't know what we're doing and we're going to make a bunch of mistakes and maybe we'll, maybe we'll succeed and maybe we'll just never find success and that's okay, That's how startups work. Like, does that shape your thinking? And have you sort of held on to that? You know, now that we're at Circle CI and grow, and I mean, we're obviously a much bigger organization with a much clearer trajectory at this point. I think there's a really meta lesson in that for me. And that one is that um, I always tell people when, you know, about that experience, about working with you and Jim, the thing I always say about it was that it was the best failed startup experience that anyone could ever have. It was seriously such a great year of my life. And I think, Um, part of that is there's probably two reasons. One, I think is that I always knew kind of what the state of affairs was, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I always Mm -hmm. knew, okay, this original idea, not going to fly. We're going to try some new stuff. It was like very clear that, um, we were in this iterating mode or that, you know, things are a little rocky at some point. And, and so I think that clarity of knowing, you know, this is is kind of tenuous, but there's opportunity here. It's fun. It's creative. Um, That for me um, is something that I think I really took from that and and can now commit to my team about to be able to say, look, like I'm going to be very clear with you about how we're doing, about the state, about the status, about the security of this role, of this business, of this company, because I've been where you are and I know you know, I know what that's like. And, and that's the biggest lesson I think that I took from that. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, how fun to be in that moment in that environment where you're like, it might not be this, but what if it's over here? It might not be this, but what if it's over here? And I think wanting to succeed and striving to succeed, but also knowing that you don't exactly know where that's all going to land. Um, just how, you know, how fun to do that. And I have no bad yeah. to say about that. Well, I, th- I mean, it's a very communications oriented viewpoint, right? Like w- clear and transparent communication, just being open and honest with each other. And I-, I would say clear expectations, right? If you're in that phase and know, hey, this is what I signed up for. This is what it's like to operate like this. And that's fun. Like it's it's a puzzle, right? You're trying to solve a puzzle kind of, of is there a business? Is there something like a human need that we can solve that's going to land or connect with people? And it only you can only pursue that if you accept that there's a really high likelihood of of failure of of not finding anything and when you you know are in the i guess uh lucky enough position to 
pursue that and to be like, you know what, I can, I can absorb the risk or I, you know, I personal, whatever personal state, you know, you're in, as long as you've signed up for it. It's very, very different. If you walk into an organization, you believe everything is locked and like, it's just a growth path from here. And it turns out there isn't actually a known, you know, a known business or business model that would be very different. So I think that takeaway is, is perfect. Like as long as everyone signed up for it, and as long as you're all open and talking about where you are, then that's, that's great. You then you have the opportunity and the freedom to, to pursue it. I do have a kind of funny failure anecdote from that too, Robin. I don't know if you'll remember this, but I'm going to bring it up because I think about it as a moment where I felt like I had failed at Copious. And mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know if you remember this, but we were doing this kind of Cyber Monday promotions, like right after Thanksgiving, trying to do a big sale. And you know, we had done this kind of Giving Tuesday thing where we had all these different celebrities and kind of like internet celebrities. And so this was, I think, 2012. So it's really in the era, like the early era of celebrity pets on social media. Yep. And we had this promotion where we had Boo the dog, who's this Pomeranian. Mm-hmm. It was like very famous Pomeranian, which is also funny. I was like such a specific internet moment. And we were selling kind of like accoutrement of Boo the dog, like leashes and beds and stuff. And I was like, I know I've done my job well as a PR person. If I can get the fans of Boo the dog to crash the site, like we can get so much traffic from this promotion mm-hmm. that we crash the site. And we, I was very confident about it. And I think I, we even had like a 404 custom page of Boo the dog. So I don't know if it was before, I don't know what the internet era is, but like, you know, yeah. if, if Boo had crashed, you'd see yeah. Boo on the website and it yeah. never happened. And so I don't know if that was, you know, a marketing failure or a site reliability <laughs> success. But I think about that a lot, about how I really wanted to crash the site with Boo fans. and just, it didn't happen. Well, I do remember Boo. I rem- That is, you're right. It's such an internet moment of just like famous pets uh, having social media accounts. And I guess it probably still exists, but it, it was like, that was that was leading edge of that. It's funny. I thought you were perhaps headed down the path of man repeller uh, <laughs> who did take down the site. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, well, it was one-to-one, I guess <laughs> there was a, yeah. like that. That's what could have happened. And it did happen in that case. Someone was such massive social following that we were just not prepared for. And a lot of like terrible operational things happened, but yeah, I think that that whole experience, uh, you know, trying to find, Exactly that. Like maybe this this is a big social thing craze. You know, are people going to get excited if we pursue that? Didn't have any impact. This might be interesting. It had a massive impact. I mean, just again, a puzzle. Like, w- what's actually moving people? What's motivating people to to behave in certain ways? And can we capture that and, and build a business around it? Like a very fun adventure, but not the one that you want to be on. Perhaps at this stage in Circle CI, where we are, which is we know exactly what our customers need from us. And we're, we're growing with that and, and working with it every day. But the, then the interesting challenge, I guess, and what you can maybe extract from that to your point is some of the things we do are not well formed, right? Like we don't know everything that's going to happen. We're constantly experimenting and trying new things. And so how do you, how do you balance that for folks? Like this is something we need to be really well understood. This is a place where we're trying to learn as quickly as possible. We make different investments. You know, as you as you think about, as you said, explaining to your team, making sure they have a clear understanding of where we're at in those different places. What do you focus on? Yeah. So I think one of the things there is just being super clear about where there's room for risk and where there's not. And mm-hmm. so coming from a comms world, um, a really probably... I don't know if this is even relevant for the listeners of this podcast, but if we think about kind of like the difference between a blog post and a press release, right? So like a press release, you put it out, you can't change it. It's out, it's done. There's no taking it back. If you got something wrong, it's wrong. A blog post, it's on our site. I need to edit it, no problem. So just kind of even knowing like, what are the mistakes that I can't change? What are the mistakes I can't fix? And then what are the things that are, um, you know, really there's, minimal risk in what we're doing and just trying to be really clear about that. Um, And then I think kind of uh, beyond understanding your risk tolerance and risk in certain areas is just knowing what is the, and thinking through everything that we're doing, what is the most cynical interpretation of anything? 
or the worst possible outcome of something that we're doing. And am I okay with it? Mm. You know, am I, is that outcome fine with me? Can I live with it? And if I can't, then we have to change. And if it's like, oh, that would be fine. Then, you know, let's fly free. Let's find out. Yeah, I think I, I think that maps really well to the way, certainly to how we think about systems and software, right? Like knowing this is high risk, requires a really big investment. This is low risk. It's actually worse for us to make a big upfront investment because that's costing us time and energy. It's an opportunity cost. We could be building something else instead of trying to make this thing perfect that doesn't really matter. And I think one of the things, kind of to the point of the, the cynical view, one of the things that we struggle with is, is then pride, right? Like, I am put I know I'm sort of academically putting the right level of effort into this thing which may be lower than than my sort of personal level of pride would associate with it you know what I mean like I I've I've made this comment a few times about conference talks and apologies to anyone who's ended up at one of them but sometimes I think you know what there's a really low attendance to this talk I'm I'm trying out some new ideas and it's only worth a certain amount of investment but then I get up on stage and I'm like this is me, like this is my personal brand and it's got like, there. I can't hide behind anything. Boy, I wish I had put a little bit more energy into preparing. Like there's, that's the conflict that we always run into. But again, to put way more energy, to spend weeks and weeks preparing for, you know, to talk to a room of five people, that's time that I could put into something else, right? So so making those trade-offs I think is, is really important. But then you do get into that moment, right? Where you're like, uh-oh. I underdid the investment. Let's uh -oh. let's call it that, right? So so then as then you look back on that, there's another part of your role in in communication like is there is there something you have to think about in terms of framing that, right? As you mm. think about those moments where, you know what, it didn't go to plan either internally, externally after it didn't quite line up with what our objectives had been. Yeah. You know, how do you think about about talking about that? Oh, talking about talking about failure, talking about even you know, maybe not failure, but kind of like missing expectations. I guess the first one is just in kind of thinking about preparation or thinking about putting, putting something out there is, do you have a minimum bar, right? What is your minimum bar of good look like? And is everyone aligned on what that is? Um, as I've gone further into the CircleCI journey, I continually find more and more overlap between the software world and this kind of marketing communications world. And just thinking about like a style guide, which sounds, you know, that's kind of like, oh, let's, but do we all agree on voice and tone? Do we all agree on Oxford commas, right? Things like mm. that. Yes, that's Circle CI. We love an Oxford comma. Um, bite me at Emma Starks on Twitter. I want to hear about it. But, um, <laughs> right. And so I think just like if we're aligned on what the minimum is and then knowing that we've kind of got room and freedom above that, um, when, some, when we do something that doesn't meet our expectations though, there's kind of like two, two sins that we're trying to avoid. And these are totally tropes in, uh, tropes and communications. But first it's like the cover up is always worse than the crime, right? So mm. if you mess something up, you just have to own it. You know, if it didn't go the way you wanted, you just have to, you know, this, this didn't go the way I wanted to go. And I think one thing that we talk a lot about on the team and in at the marketing team overall is just being super accurate in your projection against your goal and mm -hmm. trying to make it really clear to the team. I don't need you to tell me all quarter that you're going to hit a hundred percent on everything. If you hit a hundred percent on everything, you have probably sandbagged. You're probably not doing enough. We are probably not taking enough chances, but mm -hmm. I need you to be extremely accurate on your projection about whether or not something's going to get done. Because the worst thing to happen is for you to say all quarter, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. And then at the last minute, actually, it's not cool. So like, what mm -hmm. what happened there? We, we don't love that. That is, a, that is an undelightful place to live in. And, uh, and I think, well, that that point on, we'll call it sandbagging, like, and you keep talking about the, the parallels, right? Like, I, I spent half my day today talking about SLOs, right? Service level objectives. And basically an agreement between technical folks and, and other stakeholders about what is acceptable, right? It's a, it's a very clear way of documenting. We agree this error rate is okay. An error rate higher than that is bad. And at, at that point, we're going to change the way we're behaving, right? And I, I love that, like, we're all agreed on it. And then um, this point of, of pushing, like, the reason you do that and the reason it's not always, you know, 0% error rate is 
the acceptable error rate gives you space to move faster, to innovate, to put your energy into things that are more more forward looking. And then, you know, I, I'm going to share because we were talking about before, and I love it so much, this ski racing analogy, Michaela Schifrin, which is it's a bit old now, but in the Olympics kind of famously didn't do that well in this in this round. And her response, which was excellent, first of all, just like she's now my hero and I tell my kids to look up to her. But like, you know, you can fail without being a failure. And more specifically, like I wouldn't win as many races as I win if I was holding back, right? I have to push myself that hard to go out and win and like honestly dominate the entire field of, of women's ski racing. So like pushing yourself and ending up missing some goals, right? Is actually how we, how we get ahead, how we, how we win, right? And so like that notion that in order to win, you have to fail, like let's just call it that, is, is so, I don't know, to me, it just is, is really critical. And I don't know that it really lands with that many people. Of course, like the people on Twitter who are telling her how to ski, whatever, like right. we'll skip that. But I, I think that that whole framing of, yeah, if you're hitting 100% and everything, you're not pushing yourself hard enough, right? Perfection like how- can't be the goal. We can right. never be the goal. You, you won't do anything. And I think that, that even comes from the top. That comes from our CMO, Eric, who, you know, at this point I've worked with for almost six years. And the thing that he always says, and especially said at the at the beginning when we were a really small team and really repeated and really emphasized and really held on tightly to is this idea that we don't always know where the line is. Um, so we're going to push and we're going to try really hard and we're going to be creative and innovative. But when we cross the line, we have to make sure that we can come back quickly. So kind mm-hmm. of like, do your crazy ideas, do your wild things. Um, but if you, you know, if you make a bunch of people mad on Twitter because you sent out a joke or a meme, you know, something that they they didn't like because it was a blind spot that you had, you just, you have to be able to recover quickly. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and that is totally fine. So. And, and own it to your previous point. Like, Hey, yeah, we tried that. We made a mistake. Like, I, I think good. you're totally right. It's so, you know, clearly, we think about, I think about the technical side of this a lot. When I look at big public incidents, it's so much more of the discussion tends to be about the post-incident communication than about the incident itself, right? Like we're all pushing the envelope. We're all trying to do hard things. And uh, it's typically the, no, that was fine. What are you talking about? Like that's the part that people get, you know, riled up about versus the, Mm -hmm. yeah, something went wrong. Oh, here's what we're, you know, here's what it was. Here's why that was hard. Here's what we're doing to try again. You know, those sorts of things. Yeah. And, you know, another thing you always say in comms is don't waste a good crisis, right? Because we Mm. know that you can, you can come out of that uh, in a, in a better state than you were before. And if you're talking about crisis, well, you, you should be able to inspire confidence. You should leave people with this idea that, gosh, they're solving such a hard problem. I can see how that happened. That could happen to me. They learned something. They know what they're doing. Um, and, you know, we can we can move forward. We've all had that day. And I think especially for our audience, when we're talking to software developers, like we do at Circle CI, there's so much empathy out there because everyone has been there. Everyone has broken something at some point. But, you know, you can't, you can't waste that empathy. And it is a limited resource. And... Uh, we just, we really want to be conscientious and wise and um, honest and open and, you know, not waste anyone's time with an incident report or something like that, that kind of doesn't respect or value anyone's expertise about the space, right? Mm-hmm. Like our, our readers know if we're, if we're fluffing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's like, it's such a fascinating spot. I mean, it, it's, you know, just the, the incident report itself, because we want to convey the kinds of details that are both helpful to our customers to understand what we're doing and likely helpful to them in their own pursuits, right? As our customers are software developers, they're building similar types of systems. So when we learn something that can be valuable to them uh, for their, you know, for their own systems that they're building. But we often end up at this point where we're like, oh my gosh, in order to understand this, you know, you need all of this huge amount of context and what can we actually convey to folks? So I think we, 
you know, there we we do little things like try to help you understand, but maybe you, you need you don't need to know, or sorry, you would need to know too much about the system. But then I personally have made some reference to conference talks, like I'll happily go talk about all the details, or we'll write up more more interesting things about the whole system because I really do think sharing those misses is how we all learn, right? Like we love to post about how we built the perfect, you know, system of microservices or whatever, and everything went according to plan. But I don't know anyone, like really know anyone when I've spoken to them personally about their systems. That's like, oh yeah, everything went perfectly just the way we planned it from the beginning. I mean, it's always a mess, right? And that's what we have the opportunity to really, really learn from each other. And so it's, it's interesting. Like we talk a lot about learning from failure internally, but I think as a, as a community, right, by communicating this stuff publicly and talking openly about it, we all serve to, to learn and, and do better and sort of help each other. I'm also always so interested, too, in the um, desire and demand for the incident report. Like the, mm. the people are hungry for it, you know, if, if, if something goes wrong. And I think it is that that. You know, it's two things. It's kind of like wanting to know and then our, our human nature our instinct, but then also that desire to learn. And so I'm always uh, uh, very aware that you don't put that out simply to kind of cover your tracks, but also it's a service to everyone else to say, we learned this hard thing the hard way. You don't have yeah. to please take our lesson and don't make this mistake like we did. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I even find them like fascinating from other industries, right? And it's not always like, oh, if I use this database with this front end and these things, then like this problem might occur. But rather, you know, the human factors that come into play, what led to this situation? How did we diagnose it? How do we think about finding the problem? Those sorts of things. There's tons to learn in there. Um, and so, yeah, I'm one of those people who like our own stuff, obviously, I'm interested in, but I read other other organizations reports under the assumption that I'll learn something. It may not just be about the very technical details, which are interesting, but you know, how the entire organization rallied and figured something out or built a better system as a result um, of that. I do have kind of, you know, if you are writing an incident report, I think there's a formula to it, Rob. So I'm going to share it with you. And I want you to tell me, I want you to tell me if you think Mm -hmm. this is right, but this is, you know, I think if you're writing the incident report, there's basically, I think there's four things you got to hit. So I think one is, I know what happened and why. I know what mm-hmm. happened and why. If you don't know what happened, it's probably not an incident report yet. It's probably just like, a, this is happening and we will come back to you later. It's a little more like, not quite yet. Because I think one of the things we saw recently, sorry, not to totally go on a tangent, but um there was a lot of talk about the big Okta incident and their communications around it. And a lot of the criticism on that one and gosh, like total empathy and support for the people who are doing that. Cause we've all been there and we know how hard that writing is and that communicating is. And um, but a lot of the comments on that were also about kind of conflicting, conflicting answers on what they were saying. And so just that, that back and forth and the, the mm-hmm. clarity there was, was super hard. So I think one is I know what happened and why Two, I have a path to fix it. We can make it better. I know how to prevent it in the future because we know the fix isn't always the same as the prevention. And I think with prevent, there's probably, I learned something here that makes us all Mm -hmm. better. You know, therefore we have. And then the last one, which we, I remember one time, you know, probably four or five years ago, we wrote an incident report and we forgot this one. And so it's so stuck in my mind that I have written it into our incident communications guide. But the last one is, and some version of I'm sorry and thank you, um, which sometimes feels very implied. But one time it was, I remember mm-hmm. one time it was so implied we missed it. And we got a bunch of people saying like, well, what about the sorry? Like, ah, don't. So. Well, th- that is its own retro on retros, if you will, right? Like, it, it, and this is, I mean, this is the great thing. I guess, can there be a great thing about, fa- yeah, there could be a great thing about failing, right? Is that now is stuck with you. Like, yes, you've written it in the guide because other people didn't suffer the way that you suffered in that moment where you were like, oh my gosh, this is so obvious. How did I miss it? What a dummy. But, but you know, now it's going to stick with you, right? No, for, no, I don't for make a that long, mistake. 
right for a long long time and it's it's totally true like acknowledging hey look like yes we know that everyone you know makes mistakes runs into issues whatever but at the same time we also know that we're impacting you right now and we acknowledge that like we we feel that pain deeply internally like i can assure anyone listening that we feel it in droves um and so you know not expressing that is uh well it's an oversight we'll call it an oversight an oversight yeah. anyway well speaking of oversights I hear you have a story to share for the Red Build Rewind, and I'm very excited because I have a feeling I won't have heard this before. Uh, so, so dazzle me, Emma. Tell me about uh, one of your more catastrophic experiences or maybe something that felt catastrophic in the moment, but Ugh. has ultimately taught you a great life lesson. Oh, gosh, I have a good one. Um, and it's actually about our, oh, man, it's just, I'm ready to talk about it and it just is bringing me back to that place, that place of anxiety. You, you get into the motions of the moment when you tell the story and I'm in it. So um, I'm thinking about our Series F communication. So back in, I think it was May 2021, close our Series F, um, $100 million. And then along with that, we also acquired a company called Vamp. And uh, we're so excited about a big moment, acquisition money, so much momentum, very cool. And we were, we had this like very orchestrated, tightly coupled, you know, like precision communications plan where we were going to have our all company meeting and sign the agreement. It was like, we're going to sign the agreement at 9 a.m., have our all company meeting at 930. That was going to be tied with the announcement. And we you know, we tell reporters in, in advance under embargo, which is basically a pinky swear that you're not going to tell anyone about anything. Um, and then all it's all going to come out. It's going to be this like beautiful boom, 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 boom moment. And we're super excited about it. But as it happens and as, you know, as, as these things do, we had an embargo break like a, like a week in advance. I think there was like went out in a newsletter. This news went out in a newsletter a week before. And it's just like, you know, such, such a moment where your first instinct is just, it's a, it's a face palm. It's a kind of head in your desk. I'm going to scream for 30 seconds and totally freak out. And then immediately into, okay, this happened. What are we going to do now? How are we going to solve this one? Um, ultimately it ended up being fine. We were able to kind of contain it and maintain our moment. But I would say the big thing I really learned from that one um, is a, the tight coupling of many activities that you can't control in precision order is a terrible idea. And I'm an optimist, right? I believe that things are going to work out the way that I in, intend mm -hmm. and want them to, but my gosh, like we you know, definitely could have avoided that. And then I think the other one for me was the reason we had done that was because we had this kind of I don't, know, I don't know the right word, right way to describe it, but I guess this like inferred desire from our utmost leadership that this had to go out as fast as humanly possible and that any gap was like to be avoided. And so I think the big lesson that we talked about from the team there was own your expertise in your program. And just mm -hmm. because someone tells you, you know, this has to be, as tight as possible, you know, they don't, they don't know what the risks are. Like they don't, mm -hmm. they don't know. You're the expert. You have to be able to push back and say, I absolutely hear you. But the thing you want comes with all these risks is, is three days, you know, an acceptable gap. How about, is that, is that okay? You know, and, and that totally would have been fine. We work with reasonable humans. Um, but just, I think because someone wants you to jump high, you can show them that you are able to do it and also say, you know, it would be much better if we move the bar over here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Use that I, expertise. Well, so I do, I, obviously I do know the story. Yeah. <laughs> I feel a little bit like <laughs> anxious as well. Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's such a great takeaway. Right. I, like, I think I know what you're asking me for, but I have a feeling you may not have calculated all of these other things that I think about all day long, every day. Like, let me share that with you. Right. And um, 
I would imagine, I'm trying to reflect back a little bit, I would imagine the perceived risk is we tell like it, it's there's a whole bunch of internal discussion and somehow that leaks to the to the press. Yeah. You know, which sounds bad, I guess. But the press being the ones who tell a bunch of people internally what your company is up to is that's not where you want to be. That's a very yeah, that's a very uncomfortable moment. Um yeah. and so yes, absolutely some some great lessons in that. And and abs uh, like I spend a decent amount of time talking to to engineers about that. Like, yes, you you understand the system, right? We're there's a lot happening here. Help us understand what the trade-offs are, right? You could go this way, yes. You could go this way. Here's the cost and risk in each of those cases. Now we can make a good decision because we're sharing some context, right? Versus, I don't know, someone told me to do it this way. Mm-hmm. I know it's a terrible thing, but I'm just gonna gonna go do it kind of thing. And so I, I feel like there's, you know, you talked about parallels at the beginning. I, I we've worked together for a long time, so I think I knew this, but the number of parallels uh, and the the clarity of those parallels between sort of communication models and and the way we think about systems and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot there. There, there's, it's, a lot there. there's a lot. It's, I mean, it's all humans at the end of the day. And then I think mm-hmm. the other one there is just um, back to that immediate ownership, right? Just mm. this happened. This is what we're doing. This is yep. the worst case scenario. Well, the yep. worst case scenario just happened, but here's how we're going to get out of it. <laughs> And we're not we're not actually sure of a way that it could get worse right now, but here's what we got. Ugh, um, here's what we're gonna do. Well, yeah, I'm just holding. On well, to that. Uh, I appreciate you, Emma, and I appreciate your response. And that situation is quite vivid still, um, and it was it was fun times. But as you said, it worked out. Um, we'll never and, do it that way again. But we learned. Yeah, more so. more learns. More learns. More I'm learns. gonna close on more learns. More, more learns. For all. Uh, and we are sharing those with everyone, which was the whole point. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today, Emma. Uh, I knew this was going to be great. Uh, I hope folks got a whole new perspective on talking about um, about failure and communicating. Pleasure. Uh, any you know, if you're listening and you enjoyed this, you enjoyed the podcast. Subscribe on your local podcast provider. Uh, if you want to hear us talk to anyone or about anything, hit us up on Twitter at CircleCI. Emma, again, such a delight. Thanks, Thanks for so joining. Much.